Prayer, O Lord, give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me. In your righteousness, enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. For the enemy has pursued my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. He has made me sit in darkness like those long dead. Therefore, my spirit faints within me. My heart within me is appalled. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. I have fled to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of trouble. And in your steadfast love, you will cut off my enemies, and you will destroy all the adversaries of my soul. For I am your servant. Father, as we prepare our hearts to join together to worship you, I ask that you would always help us remember that the reason why you saved us was for your glory and your glory alone. And we are grateful for that. For because of that, we're able to tell the world who you are, what you have done. And as we're surrounded by trouble at times, may you come and lift, up, lift, up, lift us up. Lift up your servants, O oh Lord, because that is what we are. Again, I come and I, and I ask that you will be with the situation in Ukraine um, help our brothers and sisters that are there. Let there be humanitarian aid that's provided. Do not forget the people living there. And I pray that you will come join us in this service. Be with the speaker, Pastor John, as he delivers your message, Lord. We are grateful for all that you have done. and We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing this first song together, King of Love.
of Jesus is saved for eternity from the wrath of God, from his sins, from the punishment he deserves. What truth? And we give you glory for this truth. And indeed, heaven cannot contain the glory of the Son, the wonderful Lord. We look forward to seeing your glory in full. Right now we are tasting it by faith in the salvation that is ours, in the joy that is ours, in the forgiveness that is ours, in the fellowship that is ours, in all the gifts that you give to us in Christ. But one day we will see you face to face. And that glory in all its fullness will envelop us. And we will, O oh Lord, be ever amazed for eternity on the very fact that we are yours and that you are ours and that you made us sinners into saints, worthy only because of the blood of Christ to be fit for heaven. What an amazing truth. And we give you glory for all of this. And we thank you in the precious name of our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And um, so today we're going to continue with this parable. This is the last in the series of uh, this theme on, on forgiveness and focusing on the unforgiving servant. And so as you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, I'm just going to remind you that the daily breads are in. For those of you who use them out and give them out rather and use them for um, uh, just as a, as a means of sharing the gospel with others, they're in. You can just pick them up in the lobby on your way out. So Matthew chapter 18, we're going to resume again our reading. This is the third time we're reading this parable. And Hopefully you've been reading it on your own as well. Matthew 18, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Matthew 18 from verse 21. And then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I still forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times. And for this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his master commanded that he be sold, along with his wife and children, all that he had, and repayment be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the master of that slave felt compassion, and he released him and forgave him the debt. That slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. And so his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he would pay back what was owed and so when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their master all that had happened. And then summoning him, his master said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his master moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he would repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Lord, may you add your blessing to the reading of this word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please be seated. When I was uh, in Calabria, which is the hometown or the home region of my parents, one of the uh, interesting features of that region is how people make sure that they do not forget a debt. Uh, if you're offended by someone, if you've been wronged, then it is important 
that that debt be always reminded over and over. And uh, that unforgiveness be the trademark uh, that comes out. And not forgiveness. Because once you forgive, once you overlook a wrong, then you are seen as weak. You're seen as, well, let me say it in Italian, shamo. And no one wants to be seen as a shamo, which is an idiot. You want to be seen as strong. You want to be seen as someone who has self-respect. And I remember going to certain families and, and I would come to know of that there was bitterness and anger and towards individuals that have, had hurt them. And they would talk about this over and over and they would keep it alive. And I was intrigued by the whole thing. I said, why? And I found no other area of Italy um, that fixated with remembering wrongs. And it, it amazed me, really. Um, in this parable, we see that that's exactly what is happening. We see this man who had been forgiven much remembering the wrong, the debt that was owed him. In the past two weeks, we've looked at this parable that underscores the priority of forgiveness. We've seen uh, two weeks ago about the indebtedness this man had. By the 10,000 talents, Jesus is underscoring that our debt towards God is unpayable because he has given us so much. Just as humans created in the image of God, blessed in so many ways. Yes, there's a curse that has come into the world because of disobedience. Yes, there is sin. Yes, there are wars. Yes, there is famine, poverty, and all and disease, and so forth. But God's grace still is very present. God's mercy is present in this world. God reigns on the just and on the unjust. He shines his sun on the just and on the unjust. So God says, basically, through this parable rather, the Lord is telling us we are indebted. That's the first thing. Last week we looked at the, uh, the uh, kind-heartedness of the king. God is the only one we saw in the universe that is truly good. Uh, we sometimes use this expression, he's a good man, he's a good, she's a good mom, uh, he's a good employee, and, all, and and we say it truthfully, but good in the absolute sense, as we saw last week, there's only one who's truly good, and that is our Lord. He is good um, because he not only has done good and keeps doing good, but then he has done something more. He has redeemed us from our sins. God's people, the elect, were saved mercifully and brought into the kingdom of God. This is his doing. And therefore, we have experienced his goodness to an even greater degree. And because of this, because we owe him so much, and because he is actually good and kind-hearted, these two truths should motivate us to forgive. No one should even dare think of not forgiving. But one more truth stands out in this parable, and this is the truth we're going to focus on today, because it cautions us against not forgiving. What should happen if we choose not to forgive? And here we're going to be looking today at the severity or the, or the austerity of the king. The parable does not hide the fact that there are serious consequences when we do not forgive. And there have been times in our lives uh, where we have held off forgiving for one reason or another, even as believers. And by doing this, we do ourselves a great disservice and we dishonor the Lord. That's what this parable is underscoring. So the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the certainty of being wronged. We're going to be wronged. It says in verse 28, that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. So this simply means that there are people who are going to wrong us, people that owe us. And those that owe us... Um, we remind them of this debt. Murphy's Law is, is very well known. You know, if something can go wrong, it inevitably will go wrong. And the same is true when it comes to being hurt. 
uh, you will be hurt. You can hurt others, and you will hurt others, especially those closest to you. Hurts and pain are woven into the fabric of life, and there is no place on earth where you can shelter yourself from this kind of pain, unless you live totally isolated from everyone else, which then, of course, that's not living. You will be wronged, and you will wrong others. People will hurt you, and you will hurt others. And the closer you are to someone, the more being wronged becomes unavoidable. In Scripture, we have one man who God chose to be wronged multiple times. He was hurt several times. The man I'm speaking about is David. Now, it's true that Joseph was wronged, but he was wronged once, let's say, by his brothers, and that's it. He was hurt, he was sold, and then after that, he had to reunite with them many years later and forgive them. But in David's life, different individuals who were close to him hurt him deeply. We have, for example, his mentor and his king, Saul, who for no reason at all turned against him and hunted him from cave to cave and became David's arch enemy. He was basically convinced that David wanted his throne. Of course, that wasn't true, and he just became a man who heard him over and over. And David one time pleased with him. Why do you listen to others? Why, he says, basically trying to make him understand. But until his dying day, David was hunt, hunted by King Saul. Then you have Ahithophel, another individual in David's life. And David speaks of him in the Psalms. And Ahithophel was his beloved friend and his trusted counselor. He was very close to David. And turn, Ahithophel turns against uh, David, siding with his enemies, even going as far as planning the death of David. And that hurt him deeply. And he writes a psalm based on that experience. We see also his son Absalom, one of his favorite sons, and, uh, a hero in some ways, a very popular figure in that day because of his handsomeness, his wavy long hair, he'd cut his hair and, and they would weigh it and made, had a statue built in his honor and so forth. And Absalom, one of his favorite sons, turns against his father and leads the entire country against him. And David is perplexed by all this and hurt upon hurt, pain upon pain. Now, the question is, why would God allow David to be wronged this way, to be hurt this way several times? And uh, he speaks about it in his Psalms. He calls out to God. He asks for his help. And he says, where are you, Lord? And so forth. Well, we don't know it exactly. But we can, from Scripture, deduce two obvious reasons why God chose David to be hurt this way. David, first of all, is a picture of Christ. No living being has been more hurt than our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter writes of the wrongs Jesus receives and say in these words in 1 Peter chapter 2, 22 and 23. He who committed no sin, so that's Jesus, he committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. There was ever, ever any uh, lie or any deceitful thing said. And while being abusively insulted, notice he doesn't hurt anybody. He does only good. But our Lord was abusively insulted. He did not insult in return. And while suffering, he did not threaten, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. So David is a picture of Christ, right? So in the Old Testament, for those who only read the Old Testament, such as the Jewish people, they could look at David and see him as a picture of the Lord. He foreshadowed the sufferings of Christ, of the one who was never, insult, never insulting, never threatening, never retaliating, even though he was mistreated repeatedly. These psalms highlight the sufferings of Christ, of the suffering servant, even before Christ came. So when, in, when you read David's words in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, right? You get a, already a taste of the words that Jesus himself would utter at the cross, when he would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he's a picture. He's a type of the Christ who was going to be insulted, mistreated, and wronged. 
and would himself take all our sins and our reproaches upon himself. That's reason number one. Reason number two is that any time we, for example, we go through some pain or we are wronged by people we love or people that are close to us, family members, a brother, a sister, a spouse, someone who wrongs us deeply and hurts us deeply, when we read the Psalms, we find comfort. So basically what David went through as he penned those words, little did he know that they would be used and read by people for thousands of years. And here we are still reading his words, still finding great comfort and strength so that we do not take matters into our own hands. When we read the Psalms, we begin to realize that vengeance belongs to the Lord and it doesn't belong to us. So it helps us to entrust ourselves, like Jesus did, to the one who judges righteously, as uh, Peter writes. So we have these two obvious reasons in Scripture as to why God chose David. As I said last time, a few weeks ago, there are no such things as greenhouse Christians. In other words, Christians that are sheltered from the storms of life. And even a wrong that comes into our lives, someone who hurts us, someone who causes us pain, is ordained by the Lord. It's hard to understand this. It's hard even to, as you going through that painful experience, to even embrace this. But as we trust him more and more, we learn to accept the hurts that people inflict upon our lives. We don't place ourselves in hurt's way, of course not. But if the storm comes, we understand that Christ-like characters, Christ-like uh, character rather, Christ-like virtues are being reproduced in the lives of God's children. The believer, more than anyone else, can face hurts with a different attitude. So why is it that in places like Calabria, and there are other parts of the world, I'm sure, why is it that they would rather hold on to their hurts? Why is it they would love to, uh, they would prefer to relive them? It's because they haven't understood this verse, which is found in 1 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. A spirit of fear. What happens? If I forgive someone, I'm afraid he's going to do it again. If I forgive someone, he's going to see me as weak. If I forgive someone, it means it hasn't really, the situation has, has been resolved and it didn't really hurt me. We create a thousand excuses to why we should not forgive because we're afraid. And Paul says, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, of fear, but of power. What does that mean? God is in control. So God reminds us that everything works for our good, of love. And God loves me and has ordained everything that happens in the life of his, child, of his children. And lastly, of discipline, which means that God is cleansing the dross from me. He is refining me so that my faith, which is more precious than gold, shines. So therefore, I don't have to fear someone wronging me. If I open my heart, if I'm vulnerable, they're going to step all over me, or he's going to do it again, she is going to do it again. This kind of thinking is because we haven't understood the fact that God's Spirit is one of power, of love, and discipline. But when we don't have that understanding, we will be governed by our fear. We will have timidity. And we will walk in fear of people being hurt, hurting us or people being um, planning some kind of wrong against us. We should never, ever give in to that fear, ever. Only the enemy wants us to do that. Secondly, we see the corruption of the human heart. In this slave we find this one that has been forgiven. He's no longer a slave, by the way. He goes and finds out, he finds out, uh, finds another slave who owed him a hundred denarii, verse 28. A hundred denarii is a minuscule, uh, an infinitesimal amount when compared to 10,000 talents. This is a, a great amount in, in billions, as I said last week. When we are wronged, we look typically, at our hurts and, our, um, and the wrongs that have been done against us as monumental, as just great mountains, as Everest. 
And instead, we look at our sins against God as molehills. Yeah, we sinned against God. Yeah, we all sin. Yeah, we're not perfect. Yeah, yeah. But when we think about someone who's wronged us, wow, that memory is alive. That thought consumes us. And we're driven with feelings of anger and, and vengeance. We see our wrongs as overwhelming and our sins that we've committed against God as minor. That's what this man did. The parable tells us that he, this man owed him a hundred denarii. That is such a small amount. Not even a, way, a day's wages. Now, the, what, what, was he, what was he forgiven? The, what amount was he forgiven? 10,000 talents. And we calculated that, that that day was about $2 billion. That would be like what? Today, $200 billion. In other words, it's an unpayable amount. The 100 denarii is small. What is Jesus trying to underscore with this? He's saying, what the wrong he has done to you, whatever wrong, and you can go to whatever kind of wrong, of offense in this life. All right? I brought you the example of Simon Weisenthal, who refused to forgive the man who confessed about killing Jews and mowing them down and burning their houses, burning them alive and all this kind of stuff and was asking forgiveness from him, right? That's an awful thing that man did. And I am not in Simon Weisenthal's shoes. But what this parable is saying to us is that that wrong taken in and of itself cannot be compared to the wrong we've committed against God. That's what this parable is saying. Now, if we don't see that, we say, well, this is awful. This is really bad. How can we never, how can we compare the Holocaust to anything else? We have today people who try to keep the, the Holocaust always alive through movies, through storytelling, through books, museums. There's a Holocaust museum just on, I think it's on Cote St. Catherine. It's just always alive. Lest we forget are the words. So we don't want to repeat that, right? We don't want to repeat of that. So we keep it alive. We keep it alive so that no one forgets what was done. But if you take that in and of itself, which is an awful thing, and in our eyes, it is terrible. That, compared to the sins we've committed against God, is very small. That's what the parable is all about. No, we don't, we don't see that. We see that as awful and my sins as insignificant, as small. Only God can open our eyes to the horror of our sins and to the worthiness of God. These sins, by the way, the Holocaust, were equally committed against God because anyone who hurts anyone created in his image sins against God. But God is saying, when you choose not to forgive those who've hurt you, and now you are in a position of power, by the way. Now when you're in a position of weakness, because I, brought you that, I, I explained that last week. Uh, when a position, person is in a position of power and is hurting you, you don't just turn around and forgive him. <laughs> if that were the case, then the slaves in Egypt, the Hebrew slaves, should have said, we forgive you. Just keep flogging us and mistreating us. That doesn't make any sense. You never forgive someone who's in a position of power and is hurting you. You forgive them when you are now in a position of power, when you have leverage. And now you remember what they've done and you extend forgiveness. That's different. In fact, God's people were told after they were brought out and no longer in Egypt and no longer as slaves, they were told when an Egyptian comes in your midst, you will treat him as your brother. That's what is God telling them? So you don't forgive them then when you were slaves. You forgive them now that you have your country, your nation, and the Egyptian is visiting you. You forgive him. You treat him kindly. That's forgiveness, right? Just to going back to what I said last week. So um, the corruption of the heart is this, of the human heart, is that we will remember the wrongs that have been done to us, the hurts that have been done to us, and we nurture them and we treasure them because we cannot grasp the greatness of God's grace. And we think that our wrongs are minimal 
and that against God and the ones done against us are monumental. How do we know that for sure that we've understood God's grace? Think about it. How do I know for sure? Is it because I sing amazing grace? Is it because I know the doctrine of grace or the doctrines of grace? How do I know this for sure? I know it because when someone hurts me, I treat him the same way as my heavenly father has treated me. I forgive him because I will be wronged and I will wrong others. When I understand that my sins against God are monumental, then I will freely forgive any wrongs done against me. When instead I see my sins against God as minuscule and see the wrongs done against me as monumental, as a mountain, then I will have a very hard time and I will keep alive the memory of that wrong. Little wonder Jeremiah writes about our heart. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Our hearts, apart from God's grace, are so corrupt that we begin to see other people who wronged us in a wrong light. And then we hold them accountable and we make them want them, we want them to remember that they've hurt us. And we turn to God and, and say, Oh Lord, bless me, and oh Lord, thank you for this wonderful day and give me what I need right now. We realize that God is not listening to our prayers, as we're going to see shortly. That's why the words of Paul are real. Oh, wretched man that I am when I don't forgive. Three, the craving to get even. I spoke to you about uh, people in Calabria. But let's read these verses just so that we understand what I'm trying to say here. That slave, the one who had been forgiven, went out, found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, seized him, notice, began to choke him. But I want you also to notice that he found him, which means... He went seeking out for him, okay? It's not that he happened to just walk by and, oh, here you are. It's, he purposely went to find him. He owed him a thousand, a hundred denarii, seized him, began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me, I will repay you. And of course, this was doable. A hundred denarii, a day's wage, yes, he would have paid him. But he was unwilling, and he went and threw him in prison until he would pay back what was owed. Since we see our wrongs typically as gargantuan and uh, view our sins against God as minuscule and significant, it's only natural that we want the person who's hurt us to pay. We, they must pay. We keep saying that to ourselves. They have to pay. He hurt me, he's going to pay. He did this to me, he's going to pay, and he's going to pay deeply. I'm going to make him pay. These are the words that I've heard come out from the mouths of individuals. I remember when I was in Calabria again, I met relatives. These were relatives, okay, related to one each other, cousins and so forth. And they were divided in two factions. And the one group made sure that they never talked to this group. So whoever was a member of this group did not talk to this group. They avoided them. If they would, for example, be walking on this, down the same street, they would turn back or cross to the other side just to make sure they would not greet each other. If one was in the store, the other would look and make sure not to go in until the other one left and so forth. It was just a horrible thing. And this had lasted years. And so I asked one of them, I said, tell me, what exactly was the offense that was done to whom and when? And I kid you not. Now, obviously, these were large families and a good number of people involved. And they, <laughs> they turned to each other and they said, look, I can't remember exactly when and I can't remember. <laughs> what it was, but it was awful. It's okay, but what exactly? What, what happened? I mean, okay, you might, you, you, who to whom? Uh, I think, and they was talking about some relative years ago. And they, they preferred to stay in that environment of uh, being spiteful one to another and keeping the offense alive than forgiving each other and letting bygones be bygone. Now, why is that? Well, they bring it down to one word. <laughs> this is an important word in, uh, in Calabria. Respeto. Respeto, respeto. Means respect. Right? So he goes, if I had not respected, uh, life is not worth living. And they go on living this way. Now, again, I'm sure there are other parts of the world that live to this degree of um, unforgiveness 
But this is what I encountered in, uh, in Calabria especially. Now, we may look at something like that and laugh and say, wow, this is really ridiculous. Well, believe you me, brothers and sisters, we may not go to that extent, but any extent of unforgiveness really is, in God's eyes, reprehensible. The thought of forgiving others to some of us is so foreign that we would rather not forgive and remember the wrong that has been done against us. Paul reminds us, lest we have this craving to get even, all right, this lust to make others pay for the wrong that have done, they've done against us. Paul reminds us in Romans 12, verse 18, never repay evil for evil to anyone. Never. Verse 19, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. And as I said earlier, the Psalms help us to leave room for God to exact whatever revenge needs to be exacted by the individual that has wronged us. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But this is what you do in the meanwhile. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil by evil. Or do not be overcome by evil, rather. But overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil. How do we get overcome by evil? By refusing to forgive. Our hearts become hardened. We don't listen to God's voice. His word is no longer attractive. And uh, the songs mean nothing. And because our hearts have been hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now I'm going to go to an area of this parable that um, has caused me to pray and, uh, over the years and has caused me to watch my heart because I know how real this is. I've met individuals that have been um, disciplined by the Lord because of their unforgiveness. And in looking at their lives, I was reminded how true it is what this passage says. From verse 32, the master summons or the king summons this individual who refused to forgive a hundred denarii. Then summoning him, his master said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his master moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he would repay all that was owed him. I want you to pay attention to this part. Very important. I remember reading this and I would say, well, this can't mean that a Christian will be handed over to tortures. It doesn't make any sense. Romans 8.1, there's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why would God hand one of his children over to a torturer? I mean, the word is strong. Torture there in Greek means someone who inflicts pain. Now, please remember that in the, uh, the Jewish system, the penal system, there were no torturers. The only ones who had torturers were the Romans. So the Lord takes this example of torture from the Roman penal system and brings it into the picture to show the severity of God. Now, how do we know that this is for believers, for sure? Because here, my question was always this. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. This must be for unbelievers. God cannot hand his children over to torturers. It doesn't make any sense. How could God, God's wrath, be poured on his children? And... Uh, we need to remember two things. One is, Peter was the one who asked the question. Remember that. This was not a question from some bystander. It was Peter. He was talking to his disciples. So he's answering Peter first. So he's answering the 12. He 
He is speaking to them. And if there was anyone else there, fine. But he is speaking primarily to his own. Secondly, look at verse 35. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you. Now, our Father is the same, obviously, as our Lord's Father. So he's speaking to his brothers. He's not speaking to those who are outside of the family of God. He's speaking to those within the family of God. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you. If each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. That's straightforward. So we have two clear indications that Jesus is speaking to those who belong to him. He is not speaking to those outside the family of God. The parable is not for unbelievers, but for believers. Jesus is saying that when a Christian refuses to forgive, his heavenly Father will use the rod, inflict pain, bring in temporal calamities. Now, I've met individuals who, who having chosen the path of unforgiveness, have suffered a great deal. Some of them were even friends of mine. And I remember when I looked into their lives and I spoke to them about forgiveness, they absolutely refused. But the pain they were going through, psychological pain, physical pain, financial setback, you name it, there's one issue after another because they would refuse to forgive. They simply refused to forgive. And they would always tell me these words, you don't know the pain I have. You can't understand. I said, look, I too was hurt. I understand what it means to be hurt. And I'm sure that I'll be hurt again sometime in the future, and I will also hurt those who are close to me. But we have to forgive. That's the whole point. That's, that's, that's the essence of Christianity. If we don't forgive, we're living like the ungodly. Was, I, I, I can't. I just can't. And they would stay cemented in that position. So what exactly does Jesus mean? When in verse 34, he says that the torturers, does God actually torture? Right? He gives them over to the torturers who will inflict pain. What does he mean? I, I believe one passage in Scripture, there are several passages, but for time's sake, I'm just going to look at one. I think one passage in Scripture throws light on what Jesus is saying here. If we look at Paul's letter to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I would encourage you to read that. You can read also the book of Job in the first chapters. You can see that too there. Um, you can read in Timothy, Alexander, and Hymenaeus, who were also given over to Satan the same way as this person in the church of Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we read of a man who is flaunting his incestuous relationship with his stepmother. All right? And he was embracing the blessings of the church, being part of the church, the comfort of the church, and all the, the good things that happen in church while living this incestuous relationship. But not only living it, he wasn't doing this secretly, he was doing this uh, publicly, he was flaunting it. And so Paul writes to the church and tells them that he must be disciplined, he must be removed. The whole chapter, by the way, speaks about church discipline. Because he says, a little leaven, right? We all know what leaven is, at least those of us who bake. I, I mean, I've never used it, but <laughs> yeast, leaven, whatever, it causes the dough to rise. He says, a little leaven causes the whole lump of dough to rise. If sin is not addressed, that man will cause others in the church to sin. Basically, that's the nature of it. And so he goes, it, he must be removed. Since he is doing it, um, uh, without any shame, brazen-faced kind of sinning, he goes, he must be removed. And then he adds, in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 and 5, I don't, I don't pay attention to these words, in the name of our Lord Jesus. So he's doing this, he's taking his uh, position as a servant of the Lord. When you are assembled, speaking to the church, and I with you in spirit. So he's not there physically. He's there <clears throat> only in spirit. With the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided 
to turn such a person over to Satan. So he's this Christian, this believer, we're going to turn him over to Satan. Why? For the destruction of his body. Then, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. So what is Paul doing here? He is taking a believer with the church and handing him over to Satan. To hand one of God's children to Satan, God did it. He did it with Job. He took him and, you know, and gave him over to Satan. He said, just don't kill him. You could do anything else. And Satan had a field day with Job, right? That was a very unusual situation. Again, a picture of Christ. That's what it is. Because there was no one like Job who feared God, no one who hated evil, and no one who was righteous like Job. So God brings him up with, in regards to his walk with him, right? And then blesses him more than anyone else, gives him family like no one else, the most beautiful family. Everything is perfect in this man's life. And everybody's looking at him and goes, well, that's what happens when you serve God. Look at that. You're like Job, right? <laughs> right? And then God says, I decide rather, to take this man that he has personally groomed. That's what he did. He grooms him to be this uh, exemplary individual, an exemplary family in every way, and then hands him over to Satan. That's what God did with Job. Now, he doesn't do this, did this exceptionally. The other person who did this, of course, is his own son, whom God handed over to Satan for our sins. Right? Job is a picture of Christ. That's what really the whole story is about. But here we see Paul doing it. And it's specific. He goes, for the destruction of his body. That's what it's for. So in other words, Satan is now free to inflict pain, any kind of pain necessary, and of course there would be limits because God would bring in the limits, on this man. And as I said earlier, I've met individuals who have refused to forgive and have had diseases, have had psychological problems, have had all kinds of pain in their lives because of their refusal to forgive. Why does God do this? Because he wants to save them on the day of the Lord. That's why. God takes no pleasure. It says in Lamentations, God does not afflict the sons of men willingly. He takes no pleasure in bringing pain. But if he's going to lose someone, right, as opposed to losing him, he will bring pain and save that person. It's the same as he did with Paul. He, brought a, he let Satan buffet or, uh, you know, as they say in, in Italian, schiaffeggiare, <laughs> buffet Paul with this thorn in the flesh. Why? So that he would not be lifted up with pride, so that he would not be lost. This is God's doing, right? No one can pluck us from the hand of God, but it doesn't mean that God does not bring in pain when it's necessary. So what is Paul saying? Let sorrow come in. He no longer must be protected by the fellowship of the saints. The saints must pull back from him, this individual. Satan moves in and brings in sorrow so that at the end he will repent. Because, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 7.10, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God. So this is sorrow according to the will of God. Right. So that parable speaks of sorrow according to the will of God. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance. So why is the man who is unforgiving thrown into a place, a prison where there are tortures because God wants him to repent? And it's repentance without regret leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So godly sorrow brings about a desired result. It's repentance. But sorrow of this world, for example, if I lose something that is dear to me, you know, I've built up this business and then it goes bankrupt, I'm saddened by that, you know, and that's just sorrow. Or I lose a, a family member and sorrow, whatever kind of sorrow. 
Anything outside of the will of God, that just leads to death. Because it's a death that God initially gave to mankind when he says, the day you eat, it, this, uh, eat thereof, you will die. That's death. Death is in the world. That's part of the, the uh, uh, fabric of everyday living. Only those who are repentant can experience sorrow that is uh, godly. A sorrow that God brings about in the life of his children so that they repent. That's meaning, I believe, in this parable when it says he is handed over to the torturers. Which means, at the end, that God is very serious about forgiveness. Though the severity of God is equally true. So, yes, we have a large debt. We are indebted towards our God, and we are eternally uh, indebted to the point that we can never pay off this debt because of the goodness of God, because of the blessings of God, and furthermore, because we, as his church, have been redeemed. Yes, we've seen the kindness of God, and he is a kind God, and he forgives us totally and receives us as his children and seats us with him in heavenly places and honors us as his children. I was uh, sharing with one brother, and I've said this many times to you, how angels cannot turn to God in the first person singular. They only turn to him in the third person. They only say God is great or holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, whether it be in Isaiah chapter 6 or in Revelation chapter 5. You see angels uh, blessing the Lord in third person. We don't have uh, that kind of distance from our Father. We can call him Abba. We can call him, that means daddy. That's a, very, a term of endearment. We can call him father. We speak to him in first person because he is our God. So therefore, God is kind-hearted. He is benevolent. He is absolutely good. But he is also severe. He is also stern. He will not tolerate sin. And the sin of unforgiveness is the worst kind of sin. It's diabolical. And God will not tolerate it among his children. And he will bring whatever pain is necessary so that there is repentance in the life of his children. Now that I've said that to you, let me share about an individual that I know that has forgiven someone a great wrong. I cannot say names because <laughs> names are, uh, are tricky, right? So I know of a man who was betrayed by his wife. I know him very well. And um, this man loved his wife. And this man was um, faithful in every way to his wife, but his wife, for some unexplainable reason, uh, had an affair. And it hurt this man deeply. And I remember him coming to speak to me about it, and, and um, he was weeping and crying, and, and he was just thinking about divorce. You know, and he was just saying, what can I do? I have no choice. I have to divorce her. And he went home that night and um, he was angry, angry at that individual who um, took his wife, so to speak, angry with his wife for having betrayed him, angry with himself because he let it happen. That, those are the feelings that you go through when you are wronged. And so he, he's, he's just looking at this entire situation and he couldn't sleep that night. And this, happened, this went on for weeks. And every time he'd call me and he goes, I can't believe she did this. After all I've done for her, why would she do this? It was the uh, typical scenario of someone who was wronged and uh, deeply hurt by a, uh, an affair. And I remember him speaking to me, and sometimes in through wee hours of the night, I, I had a, such a hard time just listening to this. And I said, look, you either forgive her or just go for the divorce. You have grounds for divorce according to God's word. But if you take the higher ground, which is the ground that the Lord took with us, because we have wronged him, I said, we have heard him. If you take this higher ground, then of course, then you'll see the Lord break through in a special way. Because even if you don't take the higher ground now, you will still have to forgive her after the divorce. Right? You can't just divorce and not forgive her. You've got to be as gracious as Joseph was, I said, when he found out that Mary was pregnant. Mary didn't go tell, her, uh, tell him, listen, the Holy Spirit came over me and I have a child born of the Spirit. I mean, she couldn't say that. She didn't say anything. 
And yet Joseph did not want to shame her. He, did, he was a forgiving man, right? He was a righteous man. And I said, you, need, you have to come to, to the point of forgiving her. Now, this man was a godly man. Please understand, this man was not your Christian who haphazardly follows the Lord. This man was a, a serious Christian, a very dedicated Christian. He, he was loved by the church. He was loved by God's people, and I knew him well. So I said, you have to forgive one or another. Either you divorce, you forgive her later, or you take the high road and forgive her, and you win her as God gives you grace to win her back. Like an Hosea with a Gomer. And he was upset when I said those words. Because <laughs> I had just had enough. We, what did he, why did she do this? Why did she, I can't take it? Day after day, I was just exhausted. I said, you either do this, or you do this. I don't want to hear about it anymore. You know what to do. You know your Bible. You choose. Anyways, after... A while, I didn't hear from him. I think he was upset at what I told him. And, uh, but then I found out. This is what he did. He started to go after her. He said, Lord, you have to give me the grace to win my wife back. Just like you gave grace to Hosea to win back Gomer time after time. Even, even if it may mean that she will hurt me again this way. Because Hosea had no guarantee that Gomer would not sin. And would not be unfaithful, right? In fact, she, he, she did it several times. So he goes, that may happen. That was his greatest fear. You have to change my heart so that I could forgive her and love her. Because I want to be given another chance to love her as you love us. This was his prayer. But you have to change my heart because I just, I want to scream. And I want to just, you know, give her to the dogs and just condemn them all and see your wrath on them. Well, the Lord did give him grace. And the, to make the story short, he not only won her back, but that young man, because he was a much younger man, and basically he just, you know, he, he just flattered her and gave her attention that this, uh, the husband was not giving. That's basically what happened. And he flattered her, and she fell for uh, his flattery. That young man then repented. Many years later, not right away. She repented. She asked forgiveness. And they were reunited as husband and wife. Now, that's an amazing situation. That's very unusual. I've seen other cases where that did not pan out that way. But his forgiveness paved the way for her to change her heart. His forgiveness was so thorough. I was amazed by it. I remember speaking to him, and he would tell me how much he loved his wife with tears in his eyes. I remember one time I was at a gas station with him and he was pumping his car with gas and he looked at me and goes, you know how many times I would think about this gas and I wish I would burn her alive with it? I, would, I wanted to drench her with gas and light a, uh, light a match and turn the whole thing on fire. Oh God, forgive me, he would say. What thoughts, what evil thoughts. That's forgiveness. That's forgiveness. It doesn't mean that the pathway to forgiveness is immediate. But when we realize that God is serious about forgiveness and that the debt he has forgiven us is so great, how can we turn back and turn to him and say, you know what, I'm not going to forgive. We can't do that. We are not free to do that. May the Lord give us grace to put his word into action. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for your word. It is just remarkable. Remarkable to see how much you love us. Remarkable to see how much you have forgiven us. But we also are fully aware that we can minimize this grace and maximize the hurts we've received, the wrongs, we have received in life. Uh, we can do that. Lord, I just ask that you would give each one grace who has yet to forgive. Lord, let the severity that we read about this evening compel us to obey you. We don't want to have our lives handed over to Satan and be 
tortured in our minds, in our psyche, or physically, in whichever other way, so that we could be one day saved. We don't want that to happen to us. But we know that you will spare no expense. Because if you did not spare your son the cross, why would you spare pain in our lives? If you did not take him away from what he did not deserve, why would you not give to us what we do deserve? Oh, gracious and merciful God, truly help us to forgive all those who have wronged us from the heart so that we could honor you and bring you glory. I ask this for your sake, for your glory. Amen. Dave, let's just stay in an attitude of prayer while Dave comes to the front and leads us in worship. Christ is 
solid rock. Upon Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking Still 
my lips shall 